Sigeia, não somos a Tenaia, Vigo. Sigeia, não somos a Tenaia, Vigo. Sigeia, não somos a Tenaia, Vigo. Sigeia, não somos a Graham told Carlos that he, he, he thought he'd find a vocalist that um, would be perfect for, for Santana, you know, and uh, it was Ruben Blades before he, before he made it big. Is that right? Yeah. And so uh, Ruben was playing at a place called California Hall in San Francisco. And Carlos called me up. He says, "Oh man, we gotta go check out this vocalist that, that Bill's been talking about." You know, so we went there and checked him out. And I mean, Ruben was just fantastic. It, it would have been nice to, but anyway, I got to meet Ruben back then, and uh, we're talking probably 21, 22 years ago when he was first getting started. He was such a wonderful, wonderful man, wonderful human being. He, he taught me something real nice one time. Came to see us at the uh, the bottom line in New York, mm -hmm. and after the show, I, I got off the stage, and he was, you know, the bottom line is so small that there's really no backstage area. So he was like outside on the street, mm -hmm. along with another friend of mine, Carol Steele. And so I, I walked out there, and he says, "Hey, Roll, how you doing?" I said, "Oh, not so good. I didn't I didn't play as well as I would have liked tonight. You know, I know I could have done better." And he told me, he "says Roll, don't you ever say that to anybody." And I was really taken aback by that. You know, I was like, whoa. And, and I didn't say anything to him. And I thought, just thought about it for days. Because, you know, actually, I, what he finished it with was, nobody ever wants to hear that you didn't give your best. And I, it took me you know, a couple of days of thinking about that before I realized how correct he was, you know. To prepare for playing uh, the, the the style that I play. Yes. Um, well, I mean, before I mean, years and years ago, I used to work out a lot, you know, uh, but never with weights. I never believed in weights. Um, there was a time when I was doing like 1,200 sit-ups a day, uh, 400 push-ups a day, and jumping rope, you know, uh, more like a boxer's regimen. And because you know, I used, I used to like to fight in the streets. And box, and you know a little bit of martial arts, but not enough martial arts to really get me anywhere, you know. But m more of a street fighter, and so I just always kind of kept that that mentality, you know, of trying to stay fit and ready to you know take care of myself. And I guess that kind of carried over into my playing, you know. Um, I, I'm a an aggressive player, and when I play, I. I I guess that's one of the emotions that I touch on is that I let my anger out, you know. And but I've learned since that I have to also touch on all the other emotions: happiness, love, sadness. Because really, all all music is is co conveying your emotions. So anyway, to to answer your question, sorry I took, went on a little tangent there, but to answer your question, it's um. The way I prepare is I get together with Carlos and, and uh, Chester, and Carl, Tony, and uh, about 10, 15 minutes before the show, and we have a little prayer meeting. I think I've talked to you about that. Um, it's not so much a prayer. I mean, everybody does whatever they want to do. Carlos likes to meditate. Uh, I like to pray and just try to clear my mind for what's, what's about to happen. I try to empty myself and allow my ancestors and my loved ones that have passed on, and my, my guardian angels, to come and play through me when I, when I play. So I try to empty myself. And because I believe that the stage is our, our altar and the music is our offering to God and to the people. And when we 
when we play up there, we, we're playing with all the love that we have for God. And hopefully, the, I think that's what touches the people. You know, people walk away with a certain sense of satisfaction in, 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 in hearing our concert. It's something that, that's kind of long lasting. It takes maybe a couple of weeks for people to kind of come down from, from a Santana concert. You know, I mean, it, it's something you walk away from and you can still hear the melodies. You can still feel the rhythms, you know. Whereas a lot of other sh things or shows are just that, the shows. <laughs> inspiring people, touching someone's heart with love and emotion. And the most important thing is to be honest about what you play and what you say. It's 23, almost 24 now. And what are the changes, if you were to take a decade at a time, what changes have you gone through and what changes has the guy gone through in terms of your career and the focus that you've been with God for such a long time? Uh, let me see. Yeah. Yeah. Please. I was still growing up in the 80s too. I think in the 90s, for myself, uh, I, I, I finally reached a sense of maturity and, and, and realized that I, um, I don't have anything to prove anymore. I don't have to, I, I, in other words, I lost that insecurity because a, a long time ago, I had a lot of insecurity about myself I was always having to prove to myself that I could play. And also, I think what a lot of men go through, uh, that they have to prove, well, how do I say this? I guess I'm just gonna say it and I'll let you put it however you want. A lot of men can be dogs. A lot of men never outgrow that. They wanna always try to prove because of their sexual insecurities they're always trying to prove their sexual prowess by trying to be with as many women as possible and I went through that phase in the 70s and finished it by the 80s but really understood it and, and, and by the 90s although I I was living it in the 80s. It was really the 90s before I think I finally matured to the fact that I, you know, I feel comfortable with myself and, and have nothing to prove that way. And, and for, as far as music, uh, Davy Crockett, the, the technician, the drum, drum tech, he taught me something a long time ago. I, I, I did one solo one time, Barbara, where I got a great ovation. And I thought, well, you know what? I need the tape from this. So I got 
the tape and I, and I memorized the solo. And so the next night I played the exact same solo, but I didn't get nearly the same response. And so I figured, well, let me try it again the next night. Did the same thing, even less of a response. So I went to Davy Crockett and I said, Dave, are the lights wrong? Or are the, is the sound wrong? He goes, no, they're fine. They were just the exact same way they were the first night. I said, well, what's the problem? And he told me something that was so profound. Uh, you know, I, I, I always mention this, that he says, Roll, don't impress, express. It's such a few amount of words. He said so, so much, and I learned so much from that. You know, there's, you have to be honest with what you're playing. Carlos said it very well, too. There are artists and there are con artists. Which one are you? At that point, I guess I was a con artist, or trying to be a con artist, and I realized that wasn't me. You have to express your emotions regardless if, if you make mistakes or not. It's okay if it's honest and it's, if it's you, it's what you're feeling at the moment. So you, you can't premeditate what you're about to do. You, for it to be a true solo and true improvisation, it has to be unpremeditated. It has to come from your heart. So you have to get the, the mind out of the way. Um, anyway, those are the changes that I've gone through. As far as the band, the, the band is always, because of Carlos's direction and high standard, Carlos has always expected the best out of the band and its musicians and its music. And in that respect, it hasn't changed. He still has that incredibly high standard. Um, I've seen a lot of changes in Carlos himself over the years. I've always admired Carlos ever since I first saw him. And through working with him, I've seen such wonderful changes in him as a human being. He's always been a very spiritual person. But just as I've spoken of my own maturity and experience, he's gone through that as well. So where you know, I see ourselves on par parallel paths off a lot of times. You know, when he talks to me about something, I'm saying, wow, that's exactly what I'm going through, you know, in my, my, my life and my family and career. And so we, we talk about those things and try to help each other and encourage each other and inspire each other. So, you know, keep trying to get to that spiritual, stay on that spiritual path. In terms of uh, your career and, and the international travel that you've gone through, what experiences do you bring uh, and share with your family in terms of how how has your career affected your, your children, your wife, in a sense, because you're a world traveler? Um, you know, I mean, if one, it takes away from the family, obviously they have to sacrifice being away from you. But when you come together again, what is it that you all gain from this, from your world travel? Well, okay, I'm going to be very, very honest with you now. And you've Mark. always been like that. Well, you? yes and no. Yes and no. Yes and no. I, actually, it's been very difficult on my family um, because of I've carried with me a lot of excess baggage from mistakes that my parents have made in raising me. Um, mistakes that they didn't mean to make. They just didn't have the proper tools. They didn't know how to uh, to raise children. Nobody really does. We're always learning. Parents are always learning. And the next generation of parents will, will do it better than we, hopefully. And uh, I think the thing that I'm trying to overcome now, my wife uh, spoke to me about, she said, honey, you know, wh why do you have the anger that you have sometimes? You know, uh, get angry at the children about, you know, maybe they broke something or maybe the grades weren't, you know, as up to your standard. And so she asked me, she says, did you have, what was it like for you growing up? Were you ever abused or misused? Or? I said, no, not that I know of. I mean, nothing that I could think of. You know, my, my parents didn't beat me or anything like that. And they weren't too strict with me uh, or overly strict with me. The only thing I could think of is, well, she said, well, what was your biggest fear? 
growing up as a child. I said my biggest fear was not living up to my, my parents' expectations of me and, 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 and not being accepted by them. So I always wanted, I always had that fear that I would let them down, you know. So what's happened is I realized with my wife's help that I'm, I do the same thing. There was times if, if I did, some, did something wrong, my parents would look at me and just give me that look of maybe disgust, you know, like, you know, and just that alone, I guess, is some sort of abuse. And I'm just now, Barbara, finally getting to the point where I'm realizing this, that, and I, I've been doing it all along. And, and it saddens me a lot that I've done it all this time, but now I, I, I really want to be able to, if, if I need to discipline my children, to do it when I'm not angry. First of all, get over the anger. Don't let it out, don't show it. Wait until the proper time to discipline them. In other words, don't do it in front of their brothers and sisters or their friends. Don't humiliate them or degrade them by doing that. Wait until the proper time. Take them aside. When you have the opportunity to be alone with them, say, listen, you know what you did, I'm really unhappy with. And I want you to know that I'm not unhappy with you, but I'm unhappy with your actions. And we need to work on it. So, for me, the best is still to come. You know, it's like it's like a, a musician. You know, if you ask a musician, you ask Duke Ellington, what's the best song you ever you ever wrote? I haven't written it yet. So the best times of my life are still ahead of me. I'm still trying to get there. You know? just, just in reference, I forgot how old your kids are now. Uh, 23, 16, and 13. And my daughter, the 13-year-old, she'll be 14 um, next week. <laughs> so my two oldest are, are, are sons. They're doing great. My oldest son... He's managing the housewares department at Macy's, and I'm extremely proud of him. You know, he's making good money. He's living at home. I, I asked him to stay home because this is how I explained it to him. I said, "Listen, Roel, what it is is, you know how they have dog years. You know, and they say a dog ages what six or seven years every every human year mm -hmm. or every solar year." I said, "Well, you're you're musician children, and I'm gone sometimes between four and six months a year." So, in all actuality, instead of you being 23, you're more like about 11 and a half to me. So I need to spend more time with you. Please stay home. Don't move out on me yet. You know, I still need to spend more time with you and, you know, grow with you some more. What we'd like to say is to share a few words about the experience that we had uh, spending one day with Carlos Santana and his band. And I'd like to introduce the crew that worked very hard and dedicated a lot of time to it. The host, Adrian Dominguez Bustillos. It was great working with these people and to meet Carlos Santana and talk with them. What I've learned from him is a lot and I really great and thank you for the opportunity. I'm Barbara Bustillos, director and producer, and we'd like to continue these types of projects so that we could focus on the point of view from a, a teenager talking to his elders. It's becoming more and more important for today to stay together as family and to produce these kinds of stories. Thank you very much. I'm asking a question, so I'm <coughs> sure he's going to naturally just ship from here we go. Why don't you go ahead well, and uh, I would have worn something else for now, Steve. <laughs> huh? Just sit with the questions then? Okay. Um, you've been with Santana with, you know, over one of the longest, other than some of the other players. What about Santa has, has it made this so you don't leave? I mean, what do you dig about him? Uh, well, it's a never-ending challenge. Every day is a challenge to play with uh, Carlos. Uh, you have to keep moving ahead at all times. You can't get stagnant. And uh, like I said, that everyday challenge is what makes me stay here. I work on what I do every day. You know, I, I practice every day, and I strive to get better every day. You know, uh, I hope that tonight will be my my best performance ever. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you keep looking ahead and reaching for for goals, then uh, you won't get stagnant. You know, if you set your goals too low and you reach them, then a lot of people, you know, become complacent. You know, and think, well, I'm here, I've arrived, I'm successful. Uh, you can't ever, you know, think that you've made it. 
or that you know you're the, you're the best that you can be because you can always be better you know? yeah. and uh, playing with Carlos now what 16 years um, I what I like about Carlos is the fact that he uh, he demands the, the most out of each of each and every one of his musicians um, if you uh, it's kind of like playing sports you if you're on a team, you know, if you're playing baseball, if you go 0 for 4, you know, uh, the, the manager's going to start looking at you. You know, he's going to say, well, what's up with this guy? And if you stay in a slump too long, then uh, they're going to replace you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's basically the way it is in this band uh, with Carlos. He, he, never, he, he never fires any of the musicians. They, they pretty much fire themselves. So you have to work and work and work. Yeah. And I that you guys are the background. You guys are what makes you know, the music. I mean, do, do you feel that in you? I mean, can you feel that, like, well, the, the beats just come to you? Oh, yeah. Uh, we're we're kind of like the, the wings that, that Carlos soars on. You know, we're yeah. uh, we're a part of him, and he's a part of us. Uh, since he plays a melodic instrument, you know, he plays the solos. He and Chester are the soloists, the melodic soloists. But Carlos gives us a lot of room as percussionists to solo as well. And um, there's no other situation that I can think of other than, say, a salsa band where uh, you would get some percussion solos. And even then, it's not like it is here where you get uh, the audiences that you, that you get and get that nice spotlight from Carlos. He's not, uh, he's not selfish uh, in any way. A lot of people uh, that are you know, band leaders or whatever, they, they want all the spotlight. And everybody else, they're just background musicians. Right. You know, they could be in the dark the whole night. But Carlos isn't that way with us. He realizes that uh, it's a team effort, and uh, he gives us uh, our just uh, due every night. You know, he, he introduces us and he, he treats us with a lot of respect. You know, and I think deservedly so, cause, you know, since we work so hard. You know, what made you choose a percussion to play? I, well, it was Carlos. In 1967, I went to a, a rock and roll festival. There was like 15 groups: uh, Steppenwolf. Three Dog Night, uh, big groups from the from the day, from that time, mm -hmm. and uh, I saw the Santana Blues Band. They went in lo went on like second or third to last, second to last, just before Steppenwolf. That's what it was, and it was the first time I'd seen conga drums played outside of uh, Ricky Ricardo on I the I Love Lucy <laughs> show, and I had never you know seen a conga drum play with popular music, and the sound the the first time I heard someone hit that, that conga, boom, I just, I was hooked. Yeah. And I still am that way today. You know, if, if I'm walking down the street and I hear somebody hit a drum, I'm like, I have to follow that sound and go <laughs> to where they're at. And uh, after seeing them, it inspired me so much that I went out and I bought a conga drum uh, at a pawn shop for like $30. Uh, I'd always wanted to play drums up till then, but drums were a bit more expensive. So I got a conga drum and, and practiced, and I, it was a fleeting thought in my mind that, you know, maybe someday I might be able to play with Carlos. But I was never obsessed with that. What what I was obsessed with was, and still obsessed with, is being the best that I can be at on the conga drum. So that's pretty much how I got started. Um, I joined Malo in 1970 with with Carlos's brother Jorge, mm -hmm. and uh, I was on the the first two albums. I played with another group after that called Sapo, which was an offshoot of Malo. The, lead, the guy that sang Suavecito on the Malo album, which was our big hit, started his own group called Sapo. We went, I joined his group from 72 to 76, and then I joined Carlos. And when he called me, it was, uh, it was really, it was something. He, I, he didn't call me personally. Um, one, of the, one of his managers called me. I'm alone in the house, and I get this telephone call, and it's a man named Arnold Postilnik, and he says, uh, listen, I, I work for the Santana band. I'd like for you to come down and, and play with the band. You know, you've been recommended to come and play. So, you know, I said, yeah, great, I'll be there, you know. And I hang up the phone, and I start running around the house screaming. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> you know, it was, you know, I, it still hasn't set in with me that I, that I get, yeah. get to play with this man and, and play in this band. You know, it's, it's a dream come true for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a real Cinderella story, I guess, and 